Hello and welcome to today's presentation. We're coming to you from Studio 289 at Context Headquarters in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Now while I'm pre-recorded, everything else that you're about to see will be live. So I would like to give you a couple of tips on how you can engage with today's presentation. We're broadcasting on a couple of different platforms today. If you're watching us on LinkedIn or YouTube, I'd invite you to go to contechhealthcare.com forward slash live and join us on our own webinar platform. If you're with us on our platform today, there's a couple of ways that you can engage with today's presentation. Right up in the corner here, there's a few panels that will allow you to participate in polling, submit questions for our experts, as well as view live captions of today's event, both in English and Spanish. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you can also click over here to the expo area to be able to see contact products that may help your facility. Again, if you're watching this on YouTube or LinkedIn, there's still time for you to join us on our platform. Go to contacthealthcare.com forward slash live. It looks like my time's almost up. Thanks for joining us today. Let's get started. Welcome to our webinar, presented by Contact Healthcare. Let's meet today's panelists. Hi, my name is Michael Myers and I'm the Clinical Support Manager with Contact Healthcare. I've been with the company for 24 years and I started working with big pharmaceutical or CGMP manufacturers, but for more than a decade I've been solely focused on helping sterile compounders. Hey, Scott Harward here with Contact Healthcare. I've been with Contact for about eight years now, mostly in the healthcare division. And over those past eight years, I've been helping facilities in the Midwest and the East with USP compliance. Hi, I'm David Graham, and I've been with Contact for 24 years in a number of different roles. Today, I'm a regional business manager helping pharmacies reach compliance by teaching best practices across the Southeast. Hi, my name is Kevin Venezia. I'm the Western Regional Business Manager with Contact Healthcare. I've been with Contact for almost 12 years and in the clean room industry for 18. For the last six years, I've been working with my team to help support compounding customers with cleaning and disinfecting solutions. Welcome and thank you for joining us. We are joining you today from Contact Studio 289. In just a few minutes, we're going to be getting up and going over to our clean room sets so we can do some real world and live demonstrations uh, here in the studio. This is a, a part of our ongoing series of webinars. Previously, we've done webinars on beyond use dating and expiration dates of disinfectants and sterile alcohol, on the effects of cleaning chemistries and residues on stainless steel. We did a webinar on how to better understand safety data sheets and then uh, hazardous drug residue, not only on our CPECs, but on any surfaces in the clean room environment. So we invite you to visit contacthealthcare.com to watch and learn more about those previous webinars that we've done. But today, we're gonna focus on learning lessons from others who have made, maybe have made mistakes in the past. So the best way to learn what to do is to learn from examples of other mistakes people have made and, and what not to do. And so we've got a great panel assembled this morning. You just got a chance to meet them ago, but we've got decades of experience. Folks have been out visiting clean rooms and we've seen lots of, lots of great best practices and we've seen some practices where there was a, an opportunity for improvement. And that's what we wanted to come here today, not assigning blame, not trying to figure out, but just <clears throat> great examples of where people can learn to do things a little bit better. So, most importantly though, we want to interact with you. So if you're on that hop in platform, make sure you enter some questions. And at the end of the today's webinar, we're going to get this panel back together and we'll make sure that we answer your questions. So let's get going and talk about some examples of, of areas where people had, we found some opportunities for improvement. 
So Kevin, you've been with Contact for quite a while, but mm -hmm. before that here, you worked in clean rooms as well, primarily with like apparel and gloves, things like that. So right. you're always a huge advocate for, for proper PPE. Absolutely, yeah, PPE is near and dear to my heart. And you know, over the last you know, 12 years with Contact, you know, in the last six in healthcare, you know, I've seen a lot of different PPE used in different facilities. And you know, it's not always the right PPE, you know, it's, it's really, uh, you gotta consider what you're wearing in a clean room and that's not always the case, you know. We've got, a, I think, a picture of uh, a polypropylene uh, spun bound gown up here that, you know, we've seen over the years that comes through Central Supply and that's really not an ideal gown for a pharmacy. It has a very uh, thin particle barrier, so, you know, we are the biggest source of contamination, right? We have got uh, uh, skin particles that shed off us throughout the day and those carry microorganisms. So we wanna make sure we have a gown that's gonna protect us and not uh, be a, a hinge to our uh, potential clean room contamination. So, you know, and also that generates particles. When you walk, you get a lot of friction off that. So again, particles are gonna come off that as well. So it's uh, not the, the best gown for the clean room application. But we do have Christine over here in the, uh, in the clean room over there wearing what uh, we recommend and she's got a microporous laminate frock on there. It buttons down from the top to the bottom. And it also has a mandarin collar, so it, it protects anything coming out of the neck and, and also the, any exposure from your clothes. And then also, if you go down to the shoe covers, she's also wearing some shoe covers that are recommended, and I'll talk about that in a second here as well. Um, so that's great, yeah, she's got the low generation uh, particle gown on and uh, also has thumb loops. Um, so when you're donning your, uh, your gloves, you're not gonna ride up and, and get any exposure between your uh, wrist and your hand. So that's yeah, that, a really key feature there. Those thumb loops, that is a key thing. You know, back in the day, we, they'd actually instruct people to take a, some scissors and cut yeah. the edge of the cuff of your gown right. so that you could slide your thumb through. You know, when you're, you're working around in the clean room, your arms are gonna stretch out and you're gonna get that draw up of the sleeve up your arm and you can have exposed skin. So having that thumb loop, and thank you for Christine for, for modeling those, that uh, PPE for us, but that thumb loop is gonna prevent that from, from riding up. Absolutely. The other uh, PPE that we see uh, throughout hospitals all the time is spun bound polypropylene shoe covers. You know, they're the blue shoe covers, they got the racing stripes on the bottom mm. that can particulate as well. But those shoe covers are really thin as well, so you gotta consider, you know, what's on your shoe, right? You know, do, if you have a dedicated shoe, then maybe those are appropriate, but if, they're, if you don't, you know, you have the potential of something coming off that shoe through that, that uh, uh, shoe cover as well. And additionally, you can see here on these mops here, those particles come off those shoe covers and, you know, after mopping, you've got all those little fuzz balls on the mop there. So again, you want to make sure you're wearing the right shoe covers, the right PPE is really important and critical to your contamination control in your clean room. Yeah, that, the texture of the clean room flooring, which is great for anti-slip and you know, you've got liquids on the floor. Mm -hmm. It, it tears up the bottom of right. those general purpose shoe covers and that's that mop you showed there. Those are like dust bunnies, right. or, or little blue fur balls that got spread out all over the clean room. I've, yeah, I've also seen cases where those rubber treads you were talking about mm -hmm. literally stick to the floor mm -hmm. until you right. mop them up. They're, Absolutely. They're yeah, we talk about low linting everything in the clean room and we've seen from some facilities when they're wearing those types of shoe covers and they're working in an area, the, the, the pharmacy tech, there's almost a blue hue to that floor because so much of them shedding over mm -hmm. the years if they don't have a fatigue mat there. So, yeah, definitely not a, th that along with the, the, the rubber component of the mm -hmm. elastic uh, band coming off all the time. So Another tell sign, too, is when you see it maybe on your return vents, too, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you'll even see, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Right? So you can almost tell when, the, when those booties have been, have been being used. Right. You know, one of, when I go out and, and, and I'm not gonna use the word audit, that's so harsh, but observe clean rooms and, and talk to them about chance for opportunity. One of the biggest ones I see for PPE is improper gloves. Mm -hmm. and I know this comes sometimes through the, you know, the hospital supply chain, as it were, they're getting surgical gloves from you know, the general stores of the hospital, but a sterile surgical glove is not appropriate for a clean room environment for multiple reasons. Um, clean room gloves have been laundered actually mm -hmm. in a clean room laundry. So when they say powder free, they're truly powder free. So you're not introducing any new contaminants. But if you op ever open a pair of sur surgical sterile gloves and you open up that inner packaging, it's almost like a cheesecloth. It is a very fibrous generating paper. And you gotta think about where you're donning those gloves. I've now gone from my ISO 8 to my ISO 7 environment. I'm standing just outside my ISO 5 environment very critical area and I've got this super fibrous paper that I'm going to be opening every time I'm donning 
a pair of sterile gloves. So when you get clean room gloves, that in inside paper is going to be plastic mm -hmm. so that it's appropriate for that ISO 7 environment. And then the gloves generally will have a longer cuff than a surgical glove. So when we showed there, the thumb loop helps prevent that, that sleeve riding up. Mm -hmm. That longer cuff is just, just extra insurance policy. So it is so critical when you're selecting PPE for a clean room. The chapter says sterile gloves. Oh, well, there's a closet full of sterile gloves in the basement. I'm just going to run down there, and those may not be appropriate. You need to understand uh, what's appropriate for your clean room and make sure you select those. Mm, absolutely. absolutely. You know, David, when we talk about the right PPE, not only is selecting this right stuff, but putting it on. And you, you know, you're always uh, you're going out and teaching people best practices for donning and doffing. Yeah, and, my, and Kevin mentioned earlier shoe covers, and, and uh, they're critical because the dirtiest part of your clothes are, the, are your shoes, and you can track all kinds of stuff in with your shoes. But one time I was in a location, and uh, they didn't have a line of demarcation. In fact, they had, they had the, the pharmacy office area, and then they had an ante room and a buffer room after that. And uh, the, the guy that was showing me into the pharmacy, into the clean room, opened the door from the pharmacy office area into the ante room and just leaned on it while he used the line between the two rooms as his line of demarcation. So he was leaning on the door, keeping it open, messing up all the air, air changes, and uh, then stepping over. He did step over one foot at a time. I'll give him that much credit, but that's about all. Well, I could actually take a walk over yeah, to a clean yeah. room and show you guys how, show we, how, important how we do this. We tried to get Vanna White to come in. But, uh, <laughs> Kevin's so gonna have to I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to grab my bouffant cap here and uh, put this on first. We know this isn't the way that the chapter currently says to do it, but we like to say cleanest to dirtiest, so we start with the bouffant cap first. Then I've got my shoe covers here. And so I'm going to sit on the bench here. Now, if you don't have space for a bench, you may consider getting a stool um, if you're tight on space, but the bench is really ideal because you're not, you know, doing the balancing act here trying to get this on. So you're going to put your first shoe cover on and you're going to step over Then you're going to get your other shoe cover going and you step on over and you're in, the, in your uh, other side here and then you're going to come over and you're going to do your, your hand washing and uh, dry your hands. Um, you've got your frocks here uh, that are contained in the storage. So again, if you've got any water that might splash over, uh, you're not going to uh, have any exposure to that. And then if you're going to reuse your gown, we have that hanging up here as well, again, away from the sink so there's not any water that could splash over on any of the gowns. Um, so yeah, that's how you want to kind of have this set up and make sure that you have your line of demarcation and put on your shoe covers. Yeah, if, if you guys grab another shot of those PPE storage bins, I think that's such an important thing. The chapter is pretty specific. You want to make sure that you're storing your PPE away from the sink and that it would avoid any splashing. So if you can get some, some you know, uh, simple uh, ca cabinets like that, I'll call them. Plastic drawers you pull out, those ones there are containing multiple size of frocks and chemo gowns and mop pads. Notice it's away from the sink so we don't have any splashing and it helps keep things organized right. so when people come in you don't have hands digging through drawers going, oh where's the, let me try to find that. That person's then touched everything that's in that drawer. So get a cup, get a drawer for each specific size, it'll make it easy for that employee coming in and store your PPE so it doesn't get contaminated Absolutely. from other activities in the room. Absolutely. Like uh, Kevin said, we're the biggest form of contamination in these rooms. So mm -hmm. putting forth, you know, not only the right line of demarcation, the right area of the, of the atrium, but putting forth the right donning and doffing process is extremely important and maintaining the integrity of those types of environments. Yeah. You know, one of my big, no, I'm not going to say pet peeves, but observations <laughs> that I've made when I go out and visit clean rooms is tacky mat installation. And, I, and I'll, I, I'm sure this isn't an actual statistics, but I'd say in 95% of the clean rooms I visit, the tacky mat's installed wrong. And it's installed just like this picture you see on the screen. And the, the saying I use is that it's a tacky mat, not a welcome mat. So we're all going to just geometrically want to put that mat down in front of the door because it's a rectangle. And that's how every welcome mat that we've ever walked up to has been. But that's the improper installation for a tacky mat. The tacky mat should be turned long ways. So you see that the way that's done there. The intent is for you to take two or three steps across the tacky mat so that it can remove the, you know, the, the debris from the bottom of your mm -hmm. shoe. And so if you have it turned like a welcome mat, you're barely going to get one step with each foot across the mat. So make sure you take your tacky mat and turn it long ways. I, almost every clean room I go to has the tacky mat laid out like a welcome mat. Just say it's a tacky mat, not a welcome mat. 
Um, I've seen them installed sometimes on the wrong side of the door. So right now this is right. They've got it stored. That door is heading into the cleaner and classified environment. So we want to remove that debris from our shoe before we enter that room. And then that's where you would hopefully be putting on your shoe covers going across your line of demarcation and deeper in, into that doffing process. Um, one of the, you want to, I was just going to say, I've been in some locations where they literally step over the tacky mat because they don't want to get it dirty and use oh. it up, <laughs> which kind of defeats the purpose. Well, so, uh, the other thing I see often as well is that they don't take the tacky mat up as often as they should, you know, yeah. and it's really dirty. And they should have maybe a protocol, you know, a couple times a day, depending mm -hmm. on how much traffic they have. Right. Yeah, I've seen some that are just caked in dirt. Now, when the, when's the last time they pulled the, pulled a new sheet on that? Right, mm -hmm. it's a bit so, of a harbor point as well. If you if it's that dirty and you're walking, somebody else is walking behind them, they're just tracking that into the anteroom. Right, no right. Doubt. So. that's a great do it. Put a protocol because I mean, it, otherwise you're going to visually does that look dirty to me? Right. That looks dirtier. To, I mean, who's going to make mm -hmm. the decision on you know, sure. when you peel that peel that layer? And that picture you just had up of peeling the layer. That's one other thing I wanted to point out with the tacky mat. That actually is sort of installed wrong. You see that door there? That's going into the clean room environment. They're just outside. So the way they've laid that mat down, they're pulling the sheets toward that clean room environment. So if there's any loose debris on top of that mat that's not quite held on by the adhesive, it's kind of a jerking motion mm -hmm. when you pull that sheet off. You could actually throw debris into that clean room. So I'd want to turn that around the other way so that I'm pulling those sheet tabs away from the clean room. So Absolutely. when you're installing tacky mats, turn them long ways. It's a tacky mat, not a welcome mat. <laughs> and make sure that those sheets are pulling out. And I love your point. Put a protocol in place on how often you're going to change those sheets and make sure, you know, document what you do and, and do what you document. Make sure if you write it down that someone actually is, is inspecting to make sure that that gets done. Right. Scott, EVS equipment being brought into, into the clean room. You know, we see a lot of times in hospitals, uh, hospitals do have to rely on environmental services and housekeeping to help them mm -hmm. to maintain the pharmacy, yeah. but they can't bring their own stuff. Right, that's, that's a bit of a no-no. We want to reiterate that we're not assigning blame you know, during the, this webinar and everybody's doing the best that they can with what they've got. And, and a lot of times you just don't know until you know. Right, so we have seen some opportunity for improvement in this area over the past few years with EVS being involved. Um, so with that, you know, having dedicated cleaning supplies, not only cleaning hardware, but mop heads, disinfects that are dedicated to the clean room. And there's specific verbiage in USB at home that talks about dedicated cleaning equipment inside of that negative pressure environment as well. So that EVS team is coming in empty handed. Now we have also have seen a trend over the past few years that, that the pharmacy uh, department is bringing that cleaning in-house so the pharmacy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, team is, is doing that uh, that daily weekly and monthly uh, process there but what it comes down to dedicated cleaning supplies in the, in the clean room yep those your EVS cart that you see rolling down the hospital and other areas in the hospital you're just never going to be able to bring that cart into a clean room environment so right. That you know, you can use, you can depend on EVS or housekeeping for the for the labor to come into the room, but those supplies need to be in the room, dedicated there. Mop handle stored in the ante room. I don't know <clears> if the guys can grab a shot. We've got a mop handle um, stored on the wall of our clean room over there, and we had some of the mop heads inside of those drawers, uh, the PPE uh, where you saw the storage. So all of our cleaning supplies are dedicated for use in that room. And what Scott said, if I've got hazardous compounding, I want to make sure I've got a separate set of hardware. For that hazardous compounding space that I'm using in the in the non-hazardous space. Right, and, and and one more point to the EVS if they are involved. You know that's a bit of a high turnover uh, environment. So lean on us. Let us come in and help train your staff on the proper use of the products. How to maintain these types of environments on a consistent basis as well. What is a clean room? How should we treat it on a daily, monthly? basis? Um, and we can also sign off on their competency as well, signifying that they're competent can perform those tasks independently so mm -hmm. lean on us we'll come in and, and, and do that for free yeah we can definitely help with uh, dealing with competency and, and the environmental housekeeping and mm -hmm. EBS staff Absolutely. so we're talk we've talked about sort of making sure that we've got dedicated supplies in the clean room and we talked about having the right PPE but also sometimes we've seen improper tools that are people are using inside of a PEC or an SEC um, I visited a hospital a couple of years ago and I Grab my sample bag. I was going to show them our, our easy reach tool for cleaning a primary engineering control. And guy said, "Oh, I've got that, got that settled." And he was using, 
know when you go to the gas station and you've got mosquitoes all over the windshield and you get out that little scrubber thing and Squeaky. you start yeah he was using that to clean his <laughs> primary engineering control it had a wooden handle on it and uh you do not want to use a, a wooden squeegee to clean your window. The, the wooden handle is not appropriate for that environment, and the sponge uh, is not sort of, it would be a harbor point for bacteria, so you wouldn't want to use that. I'll go over here and show you actually our easy reach tool <clears throat> and why, you know, the guy, you know, Scott said we're not assigning plane. People are doing the best with what they have. That guy was doing a good job. That gas station cleaning tool was better than the alternative of breaking the plane. So right here we have sort of the, the plane of this device. And, we're going to be using our hand to go in and clean that, but it's never appropriate for us to put our body inside of this. Let me say that again. It's never appropriate for you to lean your body inside, especially this is a CPEC. This is a biological safety cabinet that will be in, being utilized for hazardous drug compounding. But you need to be able to clean and disinfect or in a, a hazardous drug cir a circumstance decontaminate this CPEC. So you're going to want to use a tool. You, if you're using a hand wipe and you try to lean in, I'm just not going to be able to get to that back wall without breaking the plane of that PEC. So if I'm going to be using the proper tool selection, something like our easy reach tool here and some sterile isopropyl alcohol, wet this pad out. So this is now going to easily allow me keeping my bodily safely outside of the CPEC to get in and clean the back of that wall using utilizing unidirectional overlapping strokes moving from the cleanest to the dirtiest. So make sure your body's never breaking the plane of a CPEC or a PEC and make sure you're selecting the right tools, the right fabrics and hardware when you're cleaning that PEC. You know, David's seen plenty of examples of outside of the PEC of, of people bringing in the wrong stuff to clean the SEC itself. Yeah, one time actually I was standing in a out, just outside a pharmacy waiting for a contract, a contracted uh, cleaning group to come in, and they literally had they were bringing in their carts with their buckets on them, and they literally had paint rollers that had towels wrapped around them secured with a rubber band, <laughs> and they're going to use those to clean the walls. But I was in another location, and granted, a lot of people have learned what they need to be doing these days. And and uh, this was this was maybe seven years ago. I went into a location, and uh, I was I was going to meet the EVS group that was cleaning that night. So it was 1 a.m. They we walked we walked in, and they they had their their scrubbers, their buckets, um, their squirrel fan, their dust mop, and I was supposed to train them how to clean. And I thought. We don't even have the right tools, so I, I decided I was just going to observe their cleaning method and, and uh, take notes, which I did. So the first guy brought in this, about, it was about eight feet wide, a, a dust mop, and he dusted the floor. <laughs> like and then, the high school gym? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, basketball court. And then shook it over the drain that was in the middle of the clean room, and uh, that was the first major nightmare. And then, um, then they brought in their buffers and you know, buffed up all the wax that was on the floor until it was a sludge. So they brought in their string mops after that to get up all the sludge. It, it was just, it was a disaster. And, uh, but they were so proud of the job they were doing. They had no idea that what sure. they were doing was not appropriate. Um, mm. And, but um, anyway, so after that, they put on, they put, a, I think it was called clear coat on the floor. After that, in order to help the clear coat dry quicker, they put a squirrel fan in the door going between the ante room and the buffer room to, to dry the floor more quickly. And I was standing there with the door wide open, all this air from the ante room going in the buffer room, looking at the floor, and I saw this long black hair that had been <laughs> coated, sealed, clear coated into the floor. And I'm thinking, how, I wonder, how am I going to tell the DOP what's going on because he's not going to believe it? Well, you going to say something? Well, I bet the floors and the rest of the hospital look immaculate. But in the pharmacy, uh, um, uh, shiny, what's the saying I was trying to say earlier? Shiny floors Some don't equal higher scores. Yeah, scores. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, in this case, they would have gotten a really good score as far right. as shiny. Right. But as far as clean, no. Right. So I, I went in the next day and, and talked to the DOP and the, and the pharmacy supervisor. And um, the DOP is, you could literally see the blood just drain from his face <laughs> when, he saw, when he saw what was going on. He said, I knew it was bad, but I didn't think it was this bad. And, uh, but they, you know, the, the good thing is we've come so far now, we have dedicated mops, we have um, single use mops and uh, you know, proper PPE, sterile wipes, 
disinfectants that don't have to be diluted with tap water. They're all yeah. ready to use. Mm -hmm. We've just come so far. And this particular hospital, to their credit, has done an about face. I mean, they have really, they're, they're, they have a new pharmacy and it's immaculate. So, well, it's, it's the understanding that we're in a different environment in the clean room. We were talking about PPE earlier, and mm -hmm. we just can't get sterile uh, surgical gloves and polypropylene gowns and bring them into the clean room. The string mops that they're using out in housekeeping, the, even the microfiber mop pads, those attach with Velcro. So imagine going to the clean room, you're ripping that off the backer plate, it's exploding. You know, part of the environment. Even the back of that, the, the, the Velcro on those, you know, that gets full of all kinds of gunk and debris, and yeah. you can't clean those. So you need a cleanable, right. you know, tool that you have in the clean room. Yeah. So you, you know, you can't just go grab it, you know, just because the mops are good enough for the operating room doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that they're going to be good enough for your clean room. So, right. you know, whether it's the, the supplies we were talking about earlier, the PPE, but the cleaning supplies too for the SEC, you've got to make sure that they are appropriate for you know clean room use mm -hmm. we've got you know a uh, couple of video clips of mm -hmm. our mops being used on floors and walls here in our clean room set so you just want to make sure that i always like to tell people you're you're not really mopping because the clean room hopefully is clean <laughs> when you're going in there to start right. with at least a base level of clean mm -hmm. but you're painting those surfaces with disinfectant so you got to think about that mop that i'm using right there as more of a paintbrush than you know an actual paint uh, than a mop itself so we're taking that disinfectant, we're sticking it on our paint roller, and we're rolling it onto the surface. And you just gotta make sure you don't miss a spot. If you're painting and you miss a spot, you see it. Mm -hmm. But if I miss a spot right now while I'm painting with disinfectant, that becomes a harbor point for bacteria, a place where something can grow and it could eventually lead to, to harm to a patient. So paint with, use dedicated tools for your clean room that are good at being paint brushes. Very methodical way of, of going about that right. process. Yeah. yeah. And you've got to make sure that the, even the applications of disinfectants that you're doing that. And Kevin, I know you've seen some yeah. uh, interesting ways that disinfecting can be applied. I have. I'm going to take a walk over to the uh, clean room over here again and show you what we you know, have seen. And it just adds a lot of excess amount of disinfectant onto the floor. Uh, you overuse it. It can create you know, additional odor that you don't want. But you know, we've come across clean rooms that just come into the clean room and just you know, spray the disinfectant all over and then come across and kind of slosh it around. And that's just not a great way to do it. Um, you know, our applicators are designed so that they meter out the disinfectant. And uh, we have an, uh, a video here that shows the direct application method. And uh, you can see here where you're evenly coating the mop and that allows the mop to get fully saturated and you're gonna get a nice smooth coverage like you're painting the wall or the floor with the disinfectant and you're gonna control the amount of disinfectant that you're putting on the floor which is really critical. And again, you don't want to use an excessive amount because uh, then you're going to get, you know, build up on the floors and that creates other problems as well. Yeah. Um, don't do what you were just doing, the squirting. <laughs> don't so. spray. But was it fun? It looked Yeah, fun. it looked it was fun. Yeah, it was. <laughs> but that's yeah. not the best practice. Not a good right. practice, absolutely. So, so when I think of cleaning and disinfecting in a clean room setting, there's a couple of different components. There's one is the disinfectant and, and, and maintaining proper dwell time so the disinfectant is doing what it needs to do, but also the applicator as well and using the right textile delivering that disinfectant to the floor while mechanically removing any potential contamination on that surface as well so a couple different components there yeah well, definitely with the dwell times or kill times or contact times whatever you want to refer to it as you know you really want to get a disinfectant with short dwell times mm -hmm. uh, you know one minute mm -hmm. is really ideal three minute for a sporicidal when you get up to five and ten the chances of you getting you know a, a dwell time that's achievable is really not going to happen. You're going to have to reapply, and that creates more work, more labor. Yeah, the airflow yeah. is just constantly changing in the clean room, so try, it's going to evaporate. So right. trying, a 10-minute dwell time is nearly impossible to, to try to achieve. Exactly. Yeah, and we're talking about dwell time and kill time and contact time and all that kind of stuff. We need to make sure that the people who are doing the cleaning understand the definition of that. I used to ask somebody for a definition, and I'd see these blank stares. So now instead of asking, I just tell them up front, that the dwell time or whatever is the amount of time that the solution has to stay in con contact wet for that amount of time. So mm -hmm. if it's a three minute dwell time, it has to remain wet on the surface for three minutes. Right. And you know, and if an inspector shows up <clears throat> and walks up to a technician that's got a bottle in their hand, that's, that's the inspector is definitely yeah. gonna ask yeah. them, yeah. what's the dwell contact time on that bottle that you're using right there? And they need to, they need to know. So yeah. make sure you go over your staff. If you've got uh, multiple disinfectants <clears throat> in your facility, Make sure everyone understands what dwell time they're using. And you know, with us, Paradox is a three minute for our sporicidal, that'd be for your monthly. And then for that daily cleaning with our preamp plus, that's a one minute.
dwell time. So that's a pretty easy thing for them to get, get a handle on. But whatever it is, they need to know that dwell time, and then they need to make sure they're achieving it. Not only right. do they need to know that, they need, need to make sure that they're achieving that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one of the other things with disinfectant is just the its effect on, on materials. Mm -hmm. you know, I got called out to a facility mm -hmm. once. They were very upset that, that one of our, our disinfectants had destroyed. They'd bought this table for their cleaner, and then I went in. And it wasn't stainless steel. It was, I think it was some sort of chrome, you know, very just lower grade sort of lab level um, furniture versus clean room furniture. And with all the disinfectants they were using and the sterile alcohol in less than a week, I mean, this thing was basically destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, material selection uh, across the board. Very important. Very important. So with the clean room, I, I think of, you know, these two to three rooms as a completely separate entity than the rest of the, uh, the, the rest of the hospital, even though if they're in the bowels in the basement of the hospital, some of these newer pharmacies have been upgraded. Some of them have windows, which are, which are nice. Uh, but we want to think of this as a completely separate entity, uh, but, you know, product selection, surface selection, PPE as well, because it all goes back to patient and, and, and employee safety. We're trying to clean and disinfect stuff we can't see. So that's why we have need to have different surfaces in these types of environments. So yeah, go back and reference, you know, kind of our, our, our go-to document in this world, USB 797. So page 12 of, of the 2008 version, which is still enforceable 13 years later, and then also section 4.3 of the draft, uh, which is a little bit in limbo right now, we all know. Uh, surfaces of ceilings, walls, floors, fixtures, shelving, counters, and cabinets in the buffer room shall be smooth and pervious, free from cracks and crevices, and non-shedding, thereby promoting cleanability and minimizing spaces in which microorganisms and other contaminants may accumulate. I think that's a, a, extremely important, easily cleanable surfaces. So what we're going to do is let's go over to the clean room and let's check out some surfaces. All right. So right off the bat, you know, look at this, uh, this modular clean room. I love a good modular clean room. Uh, easily cleanable surfaces here. Um, if you are going to use some type of, of, of clean room paint, make sure the manufacturer is, uh, it has you know, our products that are on the compatibility list. If they're not, then we can work with that manufacturer um, in some capacity. Uh, but when in doubt, you've already got, you know, you've already painted your surface or you've got some other type of unknown surface in there, choose a little spot and, and apply some disinfectant uh, uh, over time and see if the compatibility is an issue there. Another big area is stainless steel, clean room grade stainless steel. So 304, 316 grade stainless steel is the go-to. 316 obviously a little bit better uh, than 304, but we want all components of those stainless steel structures to be that 304, 316 grade. Not just the top, but also the bottom of our bench here. We've seen, I've seen in some facilities where the top is, is appropriate, but the bottom may be of a, a galvanized steel type deal. So over time, potential harbor points there. And also with your floors, easily cleanable surfaces. You don't want something with too much friction. You want something where you can easily deliver the disinfectant to the floor. It maintain its dwell time and killing, you know, killing what it needs to, but also so you can do the proper swivel S motion. And Kevin had a bit of a pharmacy fail to begin with, <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to proper swivel S motion out the room. I'm not starting from clean to dirty, so I don't want to hear it from y'all. But uh, <laughs> anyways, as you can see, synthetic virgin microfibers are going to do a great job of visually seeing what you're picking up. So surface compatibility, extremely important in the clean room setting. Guys, y'all have anything to add? No, I think it's good. Just making sure everything you get is stainless, stainless and the whole whole thing is stainless you know sometimes carts the top shelf will be like grade 316 stainless but then the bottom shelf isn't isn't the same quality as stainless so make sure everything you're spanking out every you know may have uh, chrome nuts or something on that so you want to make sure that that that's everything stainless yeah and even you got to consider the wheels as well because those wheels can, can degrade as well so you want to check your wheel yeah. compatibility with those disinfectants as well yeah well we're almost at the end of our webinar. We're going to get to some questions here. We want to thank you for joining us today. You know, today's a little different. Most of our webinars are pretty micro-focused on one topic that we're going to go and uh, um, that are focused on one, one topic. Um, but today we had a broad selection. And so we wanted to sort of 
learn from our examples of things we've seen, opportunities for you to do things better. Again, we weren't here to assign, assign blame or, or call out mistakes. We just wanted to give you an opportunity to learn a lot of multiple best practices. So we're going to jump into some of the questions that we've gotten here. Um, let's see here. I'm going to decide which who gets what question. <laughs> Um, Kevin, yes, they've got a they've got a contract. Their hospital has a PPE contract, and they get their yellow gowns from from Central Supply. Yeah, we come across that all the time. Where you know Central Supply has a contract with the PPE manufacturer, but when you're looking at that, you're you're kind of going against apples to oranges. You know what should be used in a clean room is not always what Central Supply is bringing in. So you got to look at those supplies and make sure that they're clean room compatible. They're the right gown. We talked about the the frock earlier. It's got the nice smooth film finish, so you're not going to generate any particles. It's got a good barrier protection. So you got to make sure you're comparing the, the, what's coming in from Central Supply versus what you should be using in the clean room. And there's a, you can go to your, I don't know who you'd have to speak to, but your management and go, look, we understand that this is the preferred path normally, that we would just go ahead and get these supplies, but we're in a clean room here. Mm -hmm. Show them the chapter, all of the requirements for this garment, the, the low linting, um, and show that the, that the yellow isolation gown doesn't meet, need it and you as the pharmacy buyer need the ability and approval to purchase special mops, special gloves, mm -hmm. you know, special PP, everything that we sort of talked about in here because it is going to be off that standard sort of what they call med surge you know, part of purchasing. Sure. So, all right, great question. Scott, um, they're using, uh, they get the, the, the hospital has a disinfectant that everyone has to use, but it comes from janitorial, the, the diluted bottles. So is mm -hmm. it okay to use that in their clean room? So I'd say no, and here's the reason why you're, you're comparing ready to use versus concentrate. And with concentrate, there's a lot more variables to consider, the, the, the source of water. And for the most part, that's tap water. And as we know, you know tap water is full of contamination. So um, you know, not, not really referenced right now in, in the 2008 version as far as the, the, the need for ready to use. Well, it may be mentioned in, in some capacity, but this new draft, you know, uh, the call for potentially sterile disinfectants inside the PEC and then they should outside. But if they are using a concentrate, it's got to be diluted with sterile water. And we know there's a bit of an issue with uh, sterile water right now. So just a lot of different variables, you know, the, turning the pharmacy techs, pharmacy team, and the chemists and having to mixing uh, chemicals and whatnot. Also making sure the right parts per million uh, are, mm -hmm. are in that diluted version as well. And if you're diluting a chemical from concentrate, the shelf life is only good for a very short amount of time. So mm -hmm. a lot of different variables who's there. Who's keeping track of that? Well, right, who exactly. mixed it on what day? Did they write on the <laughs> bottle that they mixed it? You're, you're adding another layer of complication to an already complicated day that these folks have. So right. having that ready to use, you know, stable chemistry that you know when you go grab that bottle that it's it's good. Mm -hmm. um, and you also have to document the training that takes place. These people who are diluting the product, they sure. have to have documented. Well, then you have to have dedicated uh, buckets, and should you have secondary labels on the bottles, the buckets, there's all that you that you got to consider as well. Yeah. The devices, and a lot of them is automated, so they'll hold a bottle up and it mm -hmm. automatically blends, but you got to validate that machine. Is it being blended right? So ready mm -hmm. to use is definitely. Um, so right now under the, I guess to answer, officially answer this question, we sort of went down a wormhole. Under the 2008 chapter, technically, they could get away with still using mm -hmm. that disinfectant. They've added a layer of complication, and mm -hmm. it's not a best practice. Mm -hmm. the indications are, and we, we're in a, a comment period or closed comment period, the chapter's not here yet, we, that won't be acceptable going forward. So go ahead and make the change now and, and move away from that, that diluted disinfectant. Um, David Graham, how long, can I, how long is a bottle of sterile alcohol sterile after I open it? Great question. <laughs> yeah, we get this one a lot. We also get, um, what is the BUD of sterile alcohol? Well, sterile, the BUDs don't apply to disinfectants. They That's apply drugs, to compounded yeah. sterile preparations. So, um, but we get that a lot. Let's mm -hmm. hope that up. Mm -hmm. um, after that, um, you can use a bottle if it's opened and it's used properly. You can use a bottle until it's consumed, completely consumed. If you're going to, you need to prepare it in a room, in the area where it's going to be used. So if you're going to use um, sterile alcohol inside the PEC, then you need to, you need to open it and prepare it inside the PEC and leave it in there. Leave it in there and use aseptic techniques when you're preparing the bottle too. Um, if you're using it in the SEC, um, you know, as, as long as you, again, you're going to prepare it in the SEC, SEC which is not as critical, 
um, and you leave it in the SEC, you can use it until it's consumed. What you don't want to do, if you, if you open a bottle in the, in the PEC and then you take it out, then you need to leave it out and get a new right. bottle the next time. But you can, you can use every bit of the alcohol that's in there. Um, one of the comment about putting alcohol, whether it's a bottle of alcohol or the pre-saturated wipes, if you put them in the PEC, then they need to stay in there too. Yeah. And, and I think the, one of the biggest aspects of, of this is um, is your SOPs, right. and, and if you've got a shelf yeah. life established for that product, whether it be 24 hours, seven days, 14 days, 28 days, it needs to be de depicted in your SOPs, and you follow that. I think that's what one thing inspectors are. are yeah, doing. absolutely. Well, I, another question I get frequently, which <coughs> kind of surprises me, is is that the the people who call in and, and ask the question are telling me that they're told that at the end of the day they have to throw away the bottle of alcohol, regardless of how much is left, which wow. is unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, that so is, that is definitely not, that would not be, as you said earlier, leave it in its classified right. environment where it started and you should, you should feel fine using it, whether it's a, a pre-saturated alcohol pack or a bottle of alcohol. And if you want to take a little bit deeper dive on this, actually one of our earlier webinars was specifically about understanding expiration dates of mm -hmm. disinfectants, you know, ver expiration, date, delf, <clears throat> expiration date versus shelf life and sterile al isopropyl alcohol. We took a really deep dive on that. So make sure you visit Contact Healthcare and look out, look for the uh, BUD and expiration date of, of disinfectants webinar. Okay, we've got a couple of other questions. Oh, this is a great one. Um, do you recommend doing a, a frame around your tacky mat? Any experience or recommendations for our tacky mat frame? I've seen it being used before, um, and if it's something that's going to hold down your tacky mat and you need that, then you know, go for it, but um, I've seen a lot of tacky mounts without the frame, so I think yeah. it's up to the customer whether they want to utilize that or not. Mm -hmm. The main, know the main advantage I know for it is that when you're using, using it with the frame, the frame is what's holding it to the floor versus tacky mats, the bottom of it sticky too, so mm -hmm. it doesn't move around, and sometimes it'll leave residues on people's floors that they'll need to routinely clean. If you're using a tacky mat frame, you're not gonna have that, that stickiness sure. to, of the mat to the floor. Also with the so. frame is the opportunity to clean underneath it on a, on a daily or some sort of frequent basis as well. Another tacky mat <clears throat> question. Should the tacky mat be before you enter the IV room, before the line of demarcation, or both? I'll, I'll say for me, I would say before you enter the IV room. I don't right. want a tacky mat inside my clean room with that line of demarcation because just the act of ripping, you're going to you throw stuff in the air. So my answer to that is going to be inside before I enter the IV room. Right. And when you say IV room, you mean ante room. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They're, yeah. In this hospital, they're referring to their <laughs> IV. They're going into the compound room. But okay. Before you go into that compounding room, isn't great. That, isn't that, that's proposed in the new 797, right? Well, just outside of the Andy room. Yes. Only. Well, it's actually not. Even, tacky mats aren't proposed in the new 97. That would just be best practice. Okay. Best practice placement. And this, we've actually got it here. Um, is it reasonable to go away from tacky mat use altogether the risk of introducing contaminants? And we, we sort of talked about that earlier. If, especially if you've got dedicated shoes, you know, that's mm -hmm. a best practice. Mm -hmm. Have people take off their street shoes and have dedicated Crocs or something there for them to use. I mean, that would sort of definitely raise that, that best practice up. We're getting some, some more questions and coming in. We've got a few more minutes, so let's get to them. Um, this one is, what is the resistance to breaking the plane by reaching into the PEC when the body by virtue of reaching the PC with the hands, is this already not is this not already happening? Uh, the very quick turnover of PEC uh, post clean. Why is this an issue? Um, basically, it's an issue because it's exposed skin. You know, when I'm reaching my hand in, I've got a sterile glove on my sleeve. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got a bouffant on. I've got exposed skin here. I've got exposed skin here, and mm -hmm. I'm talking. I'm generating. This is going to be one of sort of the dirtier parts of my body, so I don't want to lean that into the PEC. So. It's basically the, the exposed skin, unless you're in a full, you know, bunny suit, like might be worn in a big pharmaceutical um, or a 503B style mm -hmm. facility, you, you, that's why you don't want to lean that body into the PEC. When your arms go in, you've got your <laughs> sterile gloves as you, and you're, they're going up over your sleeves, as we talked about, with your uh, thumb loop on, so you're not going to get any of that exposed skin in that. <clears throat> um, 797 lists shoe covers as the first item put on before the mask and head covers. The preceding sentence uh, reads dirtiest to cleanest. So um, I'll handle that one. You know, that is current. If you go through the current 2008 chapter, it says to don shoe covers first and then head covers. I've never really liked that because I'm touching the dirtiest part of my body and then going up to touch 
the cleaner part of my body. So I've always taught um, that you start with the cleanest. So I'm going to come into a clean room. I'm going to put on my face mask, my bouffant. Then I'm going to grab booties, sit down on the bench, and go across that line of demarcation. Um, so that's really that's really why that that that's so critical. Um, let me finish the question here. Um, when it gets to the new chapter, so when we saw in the 2019 proposed one that was remanded in the 2021, they're going to leave it to you to determine your, your best dawning sequence. Um, and it's going to be based on your facility layout. So if your sink is ideally, as it should be, located on the clean side of the line of demarcation, you're going to have a much cleaner dawning path into that room than if you've got an older facility, maybe your sink is outside of the general area of the pharmacy you're going to have to have a different sort of donning protocol. It might even change. So we actually can help you with that. Make sure you reach out to your contact healthcare rep and determine. We think the placement of your sink is going to be the key determining factor on that donning sequence. But right now, yeah, 2008 says start with the feet, but this is one, one instance where we say, yeah, don't listen to that chapter. It doesn't know what it's talking about. Start with your hair face mask, hair net, and then do your shoe covers. All right, we are running out of time, but let's do one more question. Um, how often, and I'll let all of us handle this, how often should a sporocidal agent be used in the clean room? <laughs> well, I mean, right now the, uh, the chapter just says that you don't have to use it at all, but the new chapter is going to require it. Uh, best practice is to use it once a month in your SEC and then once a week in your PEC is what we recommend. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. No and, and the current chapter, again, doesn't even mention right. the word sporocidal. But when we get to the new chapter, now we've got our Category 1, Category 2, and Category 3. So Category 1 and Category 2, that's mostly everyone, I, hope, I assume, is watching this webinar. Mm. USP 797, patient-specific compounding. So that chapter is going to require, and it's going to require monthly application of a sporocidal on everything in the clean room, yeah. PEC, SEC, unless I'm doing category three, mm -hmm. the more, which is giving me the ability to extend my beyond use dating, then I'm going to have a much stricter regimen. So I'm going to be applying uh, sporocidals in my PEC uh, once a week. Um, then I'm going to be wearing full sterile garb, no exposed skin whatsoever. So category three is just a much different level. But yeah, 2008 doesn't mention the yeah. word sporocidal, and we know we're monthly, at least monthly in the yeah. room weekly in the hood is best practice. Unfortunately, most customers are already adopted using a sporocidal, which is, you know, best practice and, you know, that helps with uh, any type of excursions that might happen. Well, we have run out of time. I want to think we've got more questions here. What we'll do is we make sure that someone gets back to you. If you asked a question in the portal, someone will get back to you. I want to thank, first of all, these guys here that were helping me, David Graham, Scott Harwood, and Kevin Benizia. We want to thank Christine from marketing earlier who did such a great job modeling our PPE. And mostly, I want to thank uh, Daniel, Chris, and Ryan. This is our technical studio team right here. You see these two guys that were using the mobile cameras as they went around. And Daniel, put yourself up there in the control room and say hey to everyone. These guys make everything possible. If you've seen any of the production that's come out of the training videos that have come out of the clean room set or the webinars that we've produced here, those guys make all of the magic possible. We talked about it a little bit in the webinar. We have got a team of what we call blue shirts across this country that can come out to your facility and help assist you with developing best practices, help you with training perhaps any of your staff to get them up to best practice levels for cleaning and disinfecting a, a compounding pharmacy. So make sure you visit Contact Healthcare to learn more about that and thank you for joining us. For more resources like this one, visit www.contechhealthcare.com forward slash videos. This has been a Contech Healthcare presentation. Thanks for watching.